This is Kathy Barrett with the Cornell Pro Dairy Program. And uh, along with Dairy Business Communications, the Pro Dairy Program uh, runs a webinar series through the late fall and winter to early spring months every Thursday for about half hour, 45 minutes. We ask folks in the industry and on campus to present some new ideas or some some basic type of information that they'd like to share and feel that, that needs to be emphasized. So it's kind of a place to kind of keep track of what's going on in the industry and to think about some things that you can do on the farm. So today we have Dr. Rick Grant, who um, I think most everybody knows, but he's a nutritionist, PhD, and he is the president of the Minor Agricultural Research Institute. And he's going to be talking today about uh, the perfect dining experience, integrating cow behavior, housing, and feeding management, which of course is always the topic folks are trying to maximize and know as much about as possible. So today Rick's going to talk, talk a bit. If you have a question and you're brave enough to unmute yourself, go ahead and do that and you can ask the question or you can go ahead and put your question in the chat box and Rick and I will keep a close eye on that and answer the questions as we go. And if you don't hear your question answered right away, we'll make sure we get to it at the end of the presentation. I also wanted to tell you that this uh, presentation is going to be recorded. So in about oh, a few days, you'll be able to access it on the Pro Dairy website. So with that, I think Rick, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it from there. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And the sound, I assume, is okay? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here as part of the Pro Dairy webinar series today. And as Kathy just said, so my topic today is really feeding management. I've called it creating the perfect dining experience. But really, what can we think about in terms of pulling together the natural cow behaviors, what we know about housing, and then feeding management systems. And I'm just going to sort of hit the waterfront, review some recent research, and then go from there. Um, see if I can get this to, to forward. There we go. So on your farm, I like to start out with this. Hopefully the feeding management system right now is not Hell's Kitchen if you've seen that show on TV. You don't have a lot of excessive competition at the bunk. You know, empty feed bunks over here in the right panel. Uh, totally empty mangers, or maybe push-up strategy is such that it's hard for cows to reach the feed without exerting excessive pressure against the neck rail. Whatever the case may be, hopefully what you experience instead is what I would call the perfect dining experience, right? I assume that you have a, a well-formulated well palatable ration, but really the main focus here uh, is on the feed available 24-7, and I'll share some data on why that's so important, is the competition on your farm managed such that it doesn't limit feed accessibility? That's critical to the dairy cow. Water isn't really a topic for today. I do have one slide if we get to it, but water availability obviously is key in terms of optimizing feed intake. And finally, and most importantly, I just wanna get this out of the road right up front, there cannot be any restrictions in terms of the housing or the management system in terms of her, her ability to, to get resting behavior, the 10 to 14 hours a day that a cow needs, or to express adequate rumination activity. And remember that rumination and resting go hand in hand, and unless both of these behaviors are optimized, there is no way that dry matter intake or the feeding activity will be optimized on any dairy farm, all right? And you also have to know your customer, which of course is a dairy cow. And I like to think of three basic natural feeding drives that the cow cannot change. They're, they're inborn with her. One is that she's crepuscular, which simply means that she likes to naturally feed at sunrise and sunset. And so think about the farm that you're working with. Think about the, the housing systems and the feeding management. And does it reinforce her natural drive to eat early in the day and later in the day? Or does it frustrate her at every move? They're allelomimetic. <clears throat> which, excuse me, which simply means that they like to do things together. In this case, it would be, can they eat at the feed bunk together? And that's a big challenge on a lot of our farms. And finally, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, dairy cows are competitive. And so our goal here is not to eliminate competition, of course, it's to manage it at a level so the dining environment, <laughs> really if you use that analogy, the dining or feeding environment does not frustrate the basic feeding drives of your cows. 
So I'd like to start with this data set, which I consider the big picture in terms of management on the farm and the importance of management relative to cow response. This is one of my favorite all-time studies. It was done a few years ago, but they had about 50 herds, which had similar genetics. And since all of these herds were part of the same cooperative, they had exactly the same TMR fed every single day. So you can see in this study, they were able to eliminate the effect of genetics and nutrition across farms. Nonetheless, though, you can see there was a range of almost 30 pounds per day from farm to farm to farm. And I've talked about this a lot, but it's so critical to realize that nutrition is a major factor in terms of, <clears throat> of, of expressing or accounting for vari variation in milk production across farms. But in fact, the management or the non-dietary factors account for more than half, almost 60% of the variation. And what were the top factors? Well, given today's topic being feed bunk management, feeding for refusals, and herds which fed for adequate feed push-up so the cow never had to reach very far to get to her feed, look at that. This resulted in an extra four to eight or nine pounds per cow per day. And I like to ask farmers to sit back and think, what else can you do on a farm which is going to give you four to eight pounds additional milk production? That's huge, isn't it? It could be BST or not. It might be uh, milking frequency, things of that nature. But here we see something as simple as keeping feed available is one of the first factors that we should focus on when we're trying to optimize or maximize milk production. And it comes back to something as simple as ensuring feed availability 24-7. And the third one, of course, is stocking density, stalls per cow, which we'll come back to. What I'd like to do right off the bat here is share some results from a study that we've just been uh, finishing up in the last year or so, where we looked at the interaction between diet and the dining experience. We realized we have to focus not only on diet formulation, but as I said, also the management environment. And the study I'd like to share with you just in a few slides today was looking at the interaction between stocking density, which we've been focusing on over the last several years, and fiber in the diet. And does the cow's response to dietary fiber differ depending on the stocking density that we, that we really um, have on the farm. Well, we had two diets in this study, creatively labeled straw or no straw. And basically, if you look at these two, two columns here, you can see that they had the same amount of corn silage. But what we did with the straw addition, we took out some of the hay crop silage that we feed here on the farm, <clears throat> pardon me, and we added in a little bit of straw to give it more bulk, more particle size, but also to boost the, the fiber level in the diet. As you can see, then the other ingredients were pretty much the same between these two diets. Well, what did the chemical composition look like? So as we looked at these diets, again, NS is no straw versus straw. You can see the major factors like protein, fiber, starch, sugars, all these are pretty similar and right in line with, with what your nutritionist would be asking you to feed to any of your dairy cows on the farm. If we jump down to the bottom, the highlighted area here in yellow, here's where our treatments came in. So you can see that the no straw had a little bit lower particle size or physically effective fiber than the diet here with the straw added. Now, if you've been listening to some of the popular press over the last couple of years, you've heard the term undigested NDF, UNDF, which is basically a good indicator of, of the fill factor, the chewing responsiveness of the diet. And we can see here the 240 hour UNDF was higher when we added straw, of course. So altogether, a little bit longer particle size a little more undigested or indigestible fiber in the diet, it would make it sort of using common terminology a safer diet to feed. But I'll hasten to add, both of these diets are diets that we would typically see out in the industry. Neither is bad, it's simply that the straw added diet would be a little safer. So we wanted to see how these two diets performed that would be um, subjective to either low or high stocking density. And I've just pulled up one data set in the interest of time today, this is pH, and here we have the 100% and 142% stocking density. And if you've not been to the institute, basically we have a 4 barn, head-to-head -head arrangement of free stalls. So you can picture that, and that was the sort of barn where we did this study. And we had 100% stocking density based on headlocks, based on stalls, straw or no straw, what did we see? Well, basically at 100% stocking density, 
adding straw or not, really didn't have a big effect on what we call the hours that pH is less than 5.8. And that's important because 5.8 is a commonly used benchmark for indicating whether or not the cow is acidotic. Subacute rumen acidosis, or SARA as it's commonly called, the hours per day that the pH in the rumen is below that threshold of 5.8 really tells us how low is the pH in the herd, how well is the herd managed to maintain optimal rumen function and therefore fiber digestion, health, and performance. Well, we see in both cases at 100% adding straw, we're really so maybe a little over two hours per day, less than 5.8. That's not a big deal, frankly, in terms of, of the cow's rumen health and her ability to digest feed and be an efficient producer of milk. Now look at the column with 142%. Now this is interesting. Um, here we see that when we had no straw, so a little hotter diet, when the cows are overcrowded, suddenly that jumps up to four hours per day that the cow is subacutely acidotic, right? And we added straw, that dropped off substantially, didn't it? Down to just a shade under three. But here's the major point. If you consider the main, major factors of diet versus environment, which had the biggest impact on rumen pH? It was the environment, wasn't it? And in fact, overcrowding a slightly hot diet when that's being fed, then we're putting those cows at, at a much higher risk for rumen acidosis and all the negativity, all the negatives that go with that, right? In terms of rumen health and her efficiency, her digestive efficiency and her performance. I don't have time to get into all that data today, but we certainly saw negative consequences. I'd also point out, you might be sitting there listening today or some point in the future and thinking, well, I don't stock at 142%, so really the data doesn't apply to me, but I would view this as a continuum. And if you're overcrowded to some extent, you may not see four hours per day that your average cow is acidotic, right? But it could be something substantially elevated above what's desirable. And behaviorally, these animals, these changes in pH, these animals had 6% less lying time or almost an hour a day less lying time, which is critically important to the cow. And also, they ruminated less, and specifically, they had less what I call recumbent rumination, or that's rumination when they're lying down in the stall. And again, today I don't have time to get into the data, but we found in recent research that all rumination is not created equal. And especially if you're over 100% stocking density of the stalls, the rumination which is most effective at keeping pH where it needs to be it's the rumination that the cow does when she's in a stall. So we need to keep that in mind. Cows, of course, can ruminate anywhere, in the alley, in the parlor, wherever, but it's when they're in the stall and lying down, that's when they're providing the most buffer to that rumen. So we need to keep that in mind. And one more quick thing about milk components. Very small changes in rumen pH can have a dramatic impact on milk fat percent. In fact, a fellow named Tom Jenkins from Clemson has found that, on average, about only a tenth of a unit decrease in pH in the rumen, which isn't very much, is associated pretty repetitively or, or repeatably with about a tenth of a unit reduction in milk fat. So think about that. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, in the study I just shared with you, just a brief look at the, at the component responses we saw, the mean rumen pH response that we saw in that study was just under a tenth of a unit average drop in pH but that was associated with a tenth of a unit drop in milk fat. So that's important in terms of economics, and it reflects rumen health. And within two weeks, our cows are producing three pounds of energy-corrected milk less per day. Again, that, those are very large, very quick responses. So my take-home here with this first study is that overstocking is a very common negative in management environment. That had almost an hour and a half per day difference in the time that the cows were in pH less than 5.8 or they were experiencing subacute acidosis. That was much more profoundly, had a much greater impact on the cow than whether we had high or low effective fiber or high or low undigested fiber. So diet's important, as you can see, right? It had almost an hours per day difference in uh, time the cows were in SARA. But the management environment, the bottom line is that is much more important in terms of determining the cow's room and pH, all right? Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit in the 15, 20, 25 minutes I've got left here. I call this food for thought. 
But as you look at the data that's out there, that the current data, some of the older data that we've missed maybe, you know, do we need to assess some of the industry norms relative to feed bunk management? And I'm going to focus on four different factors, feed push-ups, feeding frequency, feed refusals, and bunk space, right? None of these are really new topics, but I just want to bring it front and center today, what we know and what we don't know, and the impact of, of these four factors on the cow's behavioral and productive responses. And I'll start with a very basic slide, but I think we need to start here, then everything else kind of falls into place. We need to remember that cows have a naturally aggressive feeding drive, don't they? In fact, data from Europe from several years ago now found that cows would willingly exert over 500 pounds of pressure against a feed barrier. So think about a headlock or a post and rail system, 500 pounds of pressure or more, and that's roughly twice as much as it takes for the cow to injure herself, really to cause bruising. So that's a very good working definition in my mind of aggressive feeding drive. What we need to keep in mind, what I don't have on the slide here is in the same data, they found that when cows are forced to exert that kind of pressure against the feed barrier, so in the real world, that would mean when feed's not pushed up or delivered, when they do that repetitively, they're far less likely to go ahead and, and, and get out of their stalls and access the bunk the next time the feed's delivered. So we can inadvertently train cows to become less aggressive eaters, can't we? If we don't make sure that feed's available and in front of those cows within easy reach, and I think 24 seven. And here's a picture that's worth a thousand words in my opinion. This is a photograph of a farm that I worked with when I was an extension specialist back in the Midwest. And here we see a picture you can see the pipe right here. Let me get the pointer going. Here's a four inch a pipe neck rail. And this is not too long after feed delivery in the morning. You see it's straight. And the next slide shows the same shot, but now it's about 45 minutes later. So you see what's going on here. Look at that, that bowing that occurs in that four inch metal pipe. That shouldn't happen, should it? And to me, that's just a visual uh, reflection of, of what's here on the left-hand side of this slide, right? Cows exert enormous pressure. And this was a typical herd that had all sorts of problems with feed intake, milk components, milk production, and they could not determine what was going wrong. And they looked and looked and looked at the ration, but it turns out when we came down there with our video cameras, the problem wasn't the formulated diet at all. It was the feed, and feed environment. It was something as simple as push-up strategy in this dairy. In fact, if you would ask this farmer, how many times a day do you push up feed? They would have said six times a day. And most checklists that I've seen would say, that's fine, that's perfect. But we don't think of the additional step, which is when do you push up feed? And that's where they were missing the boat. And so there was a study done several years ago by a fellow named Dennis Armstrong at the University of Arizona. And for some reason, the industries overlooked this study. So I wanna just bring it to your attention here real quickly today. They focused on push-up strategy, but pushing up in that first one to two hours after feed delivery, because every study shows that's the most competitive time on the farm. And it makes sense. You see it every day on your farm, don't you? When you lay out fresh feed, everybody's trying to eat at one time. And if you're overcrowded, it's even worse. But this study was done at 100% bunk stocking density. And you can see what they did. They had two different treatments. They either pushed up feed every half hour for the first two hours, so for four hours or four times total or they pushed up the feed once per hour for the first two hours, so twice. So you see one X per hour, two X per hour. And they were fed three times a day in this study and everything else, all the other management practices were the same. Well, intake wasn't affected, if those aren't st uh, statistically significant differences, but milk yield, energy corrected milk yield certainly was, and you can see there's a substantial increase in milk yield when they pushed up feed more frequently in those two hours after feeding. And that translated into a substantial and very biologically meaningful, I'll add, increase in efficiency of corrected milk production, energy corrected milk, right? And there was no negative effect of either strategy on the cow's resting behavior, which I think is critical. So what does this mean on your farm? Well, I'm not advocating that you should be pushing up feed every half hour for sure. But what it tells me is there's potential, I think, for improvement on some of our farms by focusing on our push-up strategy in that one to two hours after you deliver feed. Because that's on many farms when cows are most likely to push the feed back, particularly later in the day. And so that's where we should be able to see our biggest dividends. 
So I'd encourage you to focus on that. Not just think about how many times they do your push-up feed, but when. All right. And so what naturally stimulates feeding behavior? This is a big question. We could spend hours just on this slide. But in the interest of time today, I'd focus on, well, there's three big factors. Delivery of fresh feed, feed push-up, which we just talked about. And of course, that's more important during the day than at night, because in most of our management systems, not as much dry matter intake occurs in the wee hours of the day, in the evening hours. And of course, milk. We know that cows are hungry when they return from the parlor, right? But all of the data is pretty clear that the major overriding stimulator in terms of animals of feeding behavior and dry matter intake is delivery of fresh TMR. And in this slide, I'm speaking specifically about TMR feeding situations, right? And to summarize it all in one slide, in the interest of time, some great work has been done in the last few years at the University of Guelph. And they looked at basically twice versus once daily feeding. And what they found over many farms and, and several studies is, of course, if you feed 2x per day, so that's mixing up the feed so it's fresh and delivering it, and not delivering the two batches within an hour, but doing one in the morning and one is, say, as late in the day as you can or certainly later afternoon, feeds available throughout the day, more feeds available. There's less sorting against the longer particles, which is important. And overall, they saw an increase in intake and a healthy increase in milk. So the bottom line here is that 2x versus 1, 1x per day feeding, TMR, does give you an overall improvement in feed efficiency. All right. And, and earlier work certainly would say that with greater feeding frequency, you see greater rumen fermentation or better, more efficient rumen fermentation. You see greater rumination time, which is a good thing. And you see greater eating time, which many times will translate into greater dry matter intake. Now, I will add one caution. I don't have the slide in the slide set today, but I think this is sort of, there's a point of diminishing returns. Sometimes farmers will say, well, if I have the equipment, say in Europe or maybe in the U.S., if I can push up feed and I can feed more times than twice a day, should I do it? Well, I think maybe feeding three times a day would be great if you wanted to be heroic and do it. But the data, which has looked at four or five or six times a day feed delivery, actually shows a negative response on intake and milk yield. And what's going on in these studies, if you look, actually you can feed too many times a day. I think it keeps cows at the bunk for too long. And actually resting time is negatively impacted. So you never, ever want to do something which is designed to improve feeding behavior at the expense of the time during the day when they have when they can rest, because of course resting is the most critical behavior to the cow. We've known that for years. <laughs> Feeding is pretty important too, but you never want them to compete because oftentimes if that happens, resting time is what will win. Okay. So one other point I want to make is feeding for refusals. Right. This is a big. This is a hot topic these days with the cost of feed and some of the volatility both in feed prices as well as milk prices. Um, Rarely do we have a problem with people overfeeding. That can lead to sorting, but I guess I don't see that very often. What I see are bunks which look like this photograph, which is from a few summers ago where we did a study looking at what is the optimal feed refusal level. So this is 2%. And as I talk to farmers around the country, really, I find that 2 to 3% feed refusals is a pretty common endpoint. And, and I can't argue with it, um, but I will throw this out as food for thought. As you look at this picture and up and down the length of this bunk, this is 2%. And you can imagine right now there's only one cow here, but if you imagine the, all the cows in this pen, is there a chance that some of the cows, particularly the subordinate cows, or if it's a mixed group of cows and heifers, are some of these cows getting shortchanged in terms of their ability to optimize dry matter intake? And I would argue yes, because even though there's 2% feed refusals in this photograph, clearly a cow is going to have to work to get to the feed at this point during the day. And this was taken at about 23 or 24 hours into the feeding cycle, right? Um, we need to think about that. The other thing would be in this particular study, we had a high silage diet and it wasn't very uh, prone to sorting, but if you have a farm with dry forage or just large ranges in either density or particle size so the cows can easily sort, I think that makes the problem of feeding for low levels of refusals even worse even worse. And so the question I always get asked or what I think about, so let's go back to basics. The question is, okay, how long can the bunk be empty? 
because that's really linked, isn't it, to level of feed refusal. Because the lower you go, the more likely the bunk is going to be empty at some points or some amount of time during the day. Well, I know of one study which, which has looked at it, and they looked at, as you can see, 0, 3, 6, 9 hours a day of feed restriction. And what they did, they set up a situation where the cows had to go through a bit of a maze to get to the feed. And they basically restricted them from accessing the feed for those different time points. Then when they sort of, so to speak, opened the gate, they looked at how long did it take for the cow to get to the feed? How motivated was she to eat? Which would be a reflection of her hunger. And what they found is even after three hours without access to feed, these lactating cows were motivated. They essentially ran to get to the feed. I'd love to see a study done where they looked at zero, one, two, or three hours per day. That hasn't been done in, as far as I know. But my guess is that the high-producing dairy cow is going to be highly motivated well before three hours a day. She's going to be hungry before three hours without feed. And so, again, what's that mean on, in the real world on your farm? I'd say I think the bunk should never be empty or functionally empty, but for sure, for heaven's sakes, don't let it be empty for more than three hours a day because we know, based on research, those cows will be hungry. And I don't think it's good for a cow to become hungry, to, to be honest with you. All right, so moving along then, let's look at this case study. This is some work I did when I was still back at University of Nebraska, kind of looking at at least in a well-controlled on-farm scenario, what did we measure as the effect of empty bunk time? So, you know, bare bunk syndrome. This was a study where we looked at herds where they had zero versus six hours a day of functionally empty bunk. And that was from midnight to 6 a.m., which I think, if, you know, if the, herd, or if the, the bunk is gonna go empty, that's a pretty common time frame for it to happen in, right? And by functionally empty, I mean there may have been some forage or some refusals left in that bunk, but they either were things which the cow had sorted out and they wouldn't want to eat anyway, or it was like that previous slide where it would have been very hard for a cow to try to get a meal, a full meal out of what was left. Well, what did we see when we corrected the issue so that there was no empty bunk syndrome going on in this dairy? Within two weeks, look at this, they had eight pounds per day more milk. Remember, this is zero versus six hours per day. Twice as much lying activity, right? So again, we see this link between resting and, and feeding time. They had twice the amount of feeding behavior at the bunk. So more feeding, more lying time, greater milk yield, and the cows were just flat out less restless at night. They could eat when they came back from the parlor, they could lie down, and they weren't constantly up and down looking for feed, which is what was happening on this dairy all night long, between midnight and 6 a.m. until the bare bunk problem was solved. So keep this in mind, it has significant impact on the bottom line. Because what is, after all, what are the economics of plus or minus eight pounds per day milk yield? I would argue that it's pretty important for most dairies. And just a few words about stocking density as we begin to, to kind of wrap it up here a little bit. I've got to just tell one quick story about this, um, this picture. Hopefully, uh, I can't tell if you're laughing or not. Hopefully, you'll find it funny. But um, a few years ago, we had some students from the University of Vermont out in the Tillamook Valley. This was, you can tell, this was a Jersey dairy. And I snapped the picture because I thought, finally, when I give a talk on stocking density, I'll have a picture which isn't just Holsteins. I'll have a, you know, proof that, in fact, Jersey herds can be overcrowded as well. And as I lifted the camera to snap the picture, this one lone Holstein jumped up. And as if, as if she was saying, you know, save me, I'm, you know, I'm drowning in the sea of jerseys. Right? Well, then she slowly subsided back below the level of the jerseys here, and sadly we never saw her again that day. But nonetheless, stocking density has a big impact on feeding behavior. As you look at this slide, right, no one wants to be that cow in the middle. It's not fun being that cow in the middle, being out-competed for feed. And if there's anything that's basically repetitive, it's consistently reported in the literature. It says stocking density increases, feeding behavior becomes less natural, less optimal. Of course, we also have greater aggression, more displacements, time of eating can be shifted, especially for the subordinate cows, fewer meals, faster eating rate, which means what? Greater incidence of subacute acidosis, kind of going back to what I talked about in the beginning. We don't want this to happen. We also know that within limits, cows can adjust their feeding behavior to accommodate small increases in stocking density, but at some point, depending on the quality of the facilities and the quality of the feeding management, right, uh, there's going to be a fall off 
in feeding behavior and all the things that go with that, right? Room and health, efficiency of performance, and so forth. And I will also add, of course, we know that first calf heifers are far less able to adjust their feeding rates to compensate for competition at the bunk. Older cows have a much greater aptitude at that because they're larger, they're more mature. But either way, we don't want to force the cow to have to change her natural feeding behavior by very much. I just have one slide. Again, this could be a, a topic onto itself, but just one slide, food for thought here. And this is one of the best studies I've seen recently. They had a two-part study. First of all, they took just subordinate cows. They could be first calf heifers or, or mature cows, but they were subordinate. And they basically trained them so they always preferred a high palatability feed, high palatability grain mix. It, the, the high and low palatability grain mix have the same or very similar nutrient profile, but the higher palatability one was treated with molasses, it was texturized, it was just something the cows preferred. So they had high and low palatability. And then here's the, the main part of the study. They gave these cows a choice. Choice one was that they could go and eat the low palatability feed alone, right? Choice two was they could eat the high palatability, the more preferred feed, but, but it came with a dominant cow. And that dominant cow was either 12, 18, 24, or 30 inches away. So if you think about that for a minute, that's a pretty devilish choice to put in front of a cow, isn't it? A subordinate cow. Well, what did they see? Well, as we looked at this table down here, when they had very restrictive bunk space, so 12 inches or 18 inches, and this is high palatability feed with a dominant cow. They didn't care equal choice, or they chose to eat alone with a lower palatability feed. You can see, by and large, the vast majority of subordinate cows chose to eat alone when bunk space was highly restricted. And I would also add, though, with a lot of our six-row barns, 18 inches of bunk space isn't too uncommon, is it? So, again, you think about the real world, what's that mean? Well, if, if bunk space is restricted, we know subordinate cows are going to try to avoid competition at all costs and eat alone, even if it means eating less desirable feed. And in the real world, I would say that probably means sections of the bunk where the feed's pushed back, sections of the bunk where maybe the feed's more sorted through and picked over, whatever it might be, it's not going to be the highest quality, the choicest, choicest spots along that feed bunk. And what's that mean over time to your subordinate cows? That's a huge challenge, I think, for our industry. Now, the other part here is when you get to 24 inches or 30 inches, so industry standard, or something above that, and I don't know if anybody who's building barns with 30 inches of bunk space for lactating cows once you get away from the fresh period, but what does the cow tell us? This tells us even with ample bunk space, industry standard or above, 40% of the cows, so you do the math, 40% of the cows, subordinate cows, still choose to eat alone rather than compete. Again, what's that tell us? If we're grouping or managing cows in pens, right, and even if we were building barns with 30 inches of bunk space, some cows are still going to try to avoid competition, and they'll probably choose the lower quality feed. And again, from a nutritional and a management standpoint, that's one of the biggest practical challenges I think we have going forward. All right, so you ask the cow, is 24 inches enough at the bunk? Well, there's plenty of data out there which would say probably not if you ask the cow, right? The answer is no. The challenge before us in the industry is how can we accommodate what's natural for the cow, the, the desire to eat altogether, right, not experience excessive competition, how do we accommodate that in an economical way? And again, we've got to come up with those answers in the future. All right. One last point here, um, although water really isn't the main focus for today, I do want to just hit it really fast because there's some recent work which shows uh, across several farms that there's a real and repeatable relationship between additional water trough space and milk yield. And we've been saying that forever, but this is the first study I'm aware of which kind of chisels it in stone and says, yes, if you have an additional one inch per cow water trough space, you can get about two more pounds of milk, all of the things being equal. And that's something to keep in mind. Again, if you're thinking about your farm and should I be putting in another waterer, whatever it might be, Here's some concrete data to use as you're working through a partial budget. And again, I love pictures. And here's a picture from our own farm from several years ago. And if you look at this 
big old cow here in the middle, she was by far and away the most, most dominant cow I've ever seen. And she's looking up at a video camera we were installing right here in front of her. And as you look at that, every, for over an hour, she stood there as we were working on this camera. And every time this poor cow here in the back took a step forward to try to access this waterer, this cow merely swung her head back, this subordinate cow stepped back and her ears drooped, they lowered, which is classic subordinate cow <laughs> posture, right? So the fact that this dominant cow was standing here in this you know, perfectly sized alley, she guarded this water resource for about an hour. Now, the next slide shows the same uh, alley. Now we're just panning, the camera's panning over to this spot over here, and what do you see? There's no dominant cow in sight, and the water tank is fully occupied. I just want to throw that out there. We, we talk about inches of, of, of water space, four inches or whatever it might be per cow, but we can't forget about the impact of a single dominant cow. And of all the resources that can be guarded in a pen, we know that water tanks can be guarded just by close proximity of the dominant cow. In fact, work done years ago at Purdue by Jack Albright, who was really the father of, of sort of modern dairy behavior, would say, if a cow is within 12 to 15 feet, a dominant cow, just by visual contact, can prevent cows from accessing the waterer. So, so keep that in mind. So wrapping this up today, the perfect dining experience, well, there's several components which I didn't have time to get into. But again, to me, the, the first and most important thing is making sure they have comfortable resting areas and allow them to get into that stall and ruminate. That's the most effective way to keep room pH where it needs to be for intake, milk yield, and milk composition. Feed has to be available on demand, and I would say 24-7. Keep your eye on bunk stocking density. I know it's kind of um, foolish of me to suggest staying under 100% in this day and age, but still, as you creep up there and creep up there, when you get to 120% and higher, that's red flag territory for me. Feed twice a day if you can. Target push-ups for those two hours after feeding to see if you can boost efficiency a little bit. Watch your refusals. If you go over about, uh, go under about two to three percent, that may work fine, but it's a big management challenge when you think about cows and having ready access to feed around the clock. And again, when people say how long should the bunk be empty, I would say try to keep it under three hours per day. Ideally, never. All right. And I think that's my last slide. So with that, I would say thank you. And this picture always reminds me to invite people to come up and visit the institute. I have no idea where you all live today, but I can tell you from most places, it's a, it's a trip. <laughs> so but we certainly would, would welcome you to come up anytime. This time of year, probably you're better off to wait until next June, unless you like cold weather. So with that, Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thanks very much, Rick. That was excellent. So folks, if you have questions, you can either unmute yourself and ask them or go ahead and chat, uh, put them in the chat box. Rick, I have a couple of questions while folks are either typing or thinking about what they, they want to ask you. So the last, you just talked about dominant cows. So is there any way to manage that dominant cow behavior aside from stocking density? You're talking about the dominant cow herself? Yeah. Well, that, that's a bit of a challenge because people say, well, if I have a really dominant cow or several, can I just call them? And of course you can. They're not always your highest producers, right? But there's always going to be another cow typically that rises to the top of the pecking order or hooking order. I think the best thing we can do, unless you have a, just a grossly dominant cow, is to just make sure you have ample access in terms of inches, right, or uh, bunk space, water space, have enough stalls. And then time budget is another big thing, which I didn't talk about today, but make sure the cows have enough hours in that pen so even if maybe they're out competed at one point during the day, they have a lot of opportunity to get back to it later, right? Because at some point, the dominant cow's got to go do something else. I think that's probably the best practical answer, but I would really challenge the industry that maybe we've undervalued the importance of, of bunk space and, and felt too comfortable saying 24 inches is enough and 18 inches isn't that bad. I'm beginning to think that maybe 24 inches isn't quite enough unless you have excellent management. And 18 inches is, is kind of a disaster waiting to happen. Okay. How's that for an answer? Good, good. And then I had a um, couple of other questions as well. So stocking density, the, its impact, is it because of the limited bunk space 
or is it because of the stress of not having a stall? Which is the, or actually, I'm like, which is the, which is factor worse? that has the biggest impact or has the most impact? Yeah, well, the easy answers are both important. Right. Yeah, speaking for the cow, I think, and, and I'm going to put the fresh cow in a separate bucket because I'm, you know, the, the huge link, there's a strong link between feed accessibility and metabolic disorders is well shown. And so you don't want to limit bunk space for sure with the, with the fresh cow. But once she's off and running, I'm guessing the cow probably prioritizes access to stalls. The data would say that because when we do all of our overcrowding studies, if cows have lost resting time to make up, they will walk by a feed bunk coming back from the parlor when you know they're hungry and they'll go and lie down. So I, I tend to think of stocking density first and foremost on a stall basis, right? Because mm -hmm. she needs to get off her feet, and I didn't have time to get into it, but the data we're collecting in the last few months shows that it's the, it's the rumination activity when the cow's in the stalls, when she's overcrowded, that is what really maintains rumen pH more effectively than any other kind of rumination. Okay. So folks, I unmuted everyone, so in case you want to just go ahead and ask your question, feel free to do that. So Rick, I have just one more from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just wondered if that feed delivery stimulus is decreased if you have feed in front of them all the time. Oh, well, for sure. I think the key thing to me is that the feed is there, right? Um, what I've found when you go on farms, the farms are the, where the cows are most likely to, to jump up out of the stalls and run to the bunk when fresh feed is delivered. I mean, that's a good thing, but I think that sometimes maybe those are the, the dairies where the feed hasn't been as available as it, as it might be between feed deliveries, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're doing a good job of keeping feed pushed up, uh, cows aren't as likely to run up and, and access the feed. So, um, feed delivery is important. Twice a day is good. I think it helps keep the feed in condition, but beyond that, I think you can do a good job with it. Good, good push-up strategy, especially more and more focusing on the times of the day when they're likely to have a big meal and push the feet away quickly. Okay, so any questions from the participants? Uh, well, hearing none, Rick, I'll thank you again for an excellent presentation. Very much appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I'd like to thank all the folks who have joined us today. Um, I would like to uh, kind of put a plug in for next week's Thursday Dairy Update. Dr. Rob Lynch, um, veterinarian on staff here with Pro Dairy, he is going to be talking about some of the research that's just come out of Cornell on voluntary wait period, um, looking at what impact it has on uh, future milk production for first calf, hef uh, first calf heifers and then um, uh, older cows. So I hope you'll join us um, next week for that at 12.30. So with that, again, thank you, Rick, and we'll sign off. Everybody have a really nice day.